Hmm. Oh, 10 o'clock. Time to go. Rob 101. Wow. Great turnout today. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're doing nonlinear stuff for a change. So we just got started and defined a root of a function. So those are points where the function vanishes. So we're used to doing that for polynomials. We have essentially looked for roots when we had ax equals b because we do ax minus b equals zero, then the solution is a root of that linear equation. Um, <clears throat> We talked briefly about if you want to set the right-hand side to a constant, is that still a root-finding problem? Yeah, basically. Okay, you just translate the function and you get it. Um, do all functions have roots, and especially functions that we're used to having roots, do they always have roots with this definition? No. Just take the simple polynomial x squared plus 1. Um, it has no real roots, and since our roots are elements, of Rm, where m can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. Um, we're only looking for real solutions to the equation. Hence, there are no roots for x squared plus 1. OK, so it's got its pluses, very general functions. It's got its minuses, um, not the most general possible notion of a root that one could possibly ever do. <clears throat> OK. so. With that in mind, I'm just going to remind each other what is a function, because I need to make sure when we're looking at continuity, we really understand what a function is. So we learned that a function is a rule that maps some set A to some set B. So it takes each element of A to an element B in B that we denote by f of a, okay? So that's what that symbol f colon a right arrow b means to be a function. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just do some really brief examples, and then I'll be able to give a tongue-in-cheek definition of continuity. Okay, so I'll take A is the closed interval minus 1, 1, so that's a subset of the reals. And I'll take B to be all of the reals. I don't care. And then I want to look at potential... rules and see if they generate functions. Okay, so we'll do the first one. F at a point A is equal to A squared. Zoop. I won't do my fancy arrows for this, but Okay, you could basically get that. So yes, function, okay? That's a function. Two. Every point in A gets mapped to a half. Is that a function? Minus 1, 1, and I guess that's about a half. Yep. That's a function. 
So what is a non-function that's coming up? So I'm going to define f of a. I'm going to still give a rule, but it's a little bit more complicated. It'll be minus 1 if a is greater than or equal to minus 1, but strictly less than 0. It'll be equal to plus 2 if a is strictly greater than 0 and less than or equal to 1. And then I'm going to sign it the interval minus 1, 2 when a is equal to 0. Okay, so this is what I really want to get across. Let me, let me draw the graph and then you'll see why this is an interesting example. It's worth being a little bit more elaborate here. Bingo. Okay, so for over here, it looks like this. And then for up here, it's roughly like this. But at zero, I give it the entire interval there, okay? Okay, I overwrote my thing. <clears throat> so that is not a function. It's not taking a point to a point. It's taking a point to a subset that has more than one element, okay? So it's, this is not a function. Okay, and the way you would typically draw the graph of that function, you know, if you're just doing it by hand, but also if you try to plot it in Julia, you know, it'll just look like a continuous thing here, okay? But you have to understand at the point zero, you've assigned this entire interval to a single value, and that's not a function. It's not assigning a point A to a point in B. It's an interval. That's the key thing. Okay, so it's subtle, um, but without that, the following uh, definition does not work, okay? Because remember, we assume no calculus in Rob 101, so this is A little bit tongue-in-cheek, okay? And it's because we're not assuming calculus. The correct definition is given in the book in terms of epsilons and deltas, but that's okay. This is good enough for us. So we assume it's a function, and we'll just do it from the reals to the reals, or a subset of the reals to the reals, We'll say it's continuous I'm sure you guys have heard this one before. If you can draw its graph, without lifting your pencil from the page. Everybody heard this kind of, this was your early definition in high school of continuity? Yeah, okay. And so why did I make a big deal? You know, because this one, it looks like, you know, Well, my arrow's not quite at right angles, but you guys can apply Gram-Schmidt and fix my axes, okay? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, the thing is, okay, so if you were just doing something with a step, look, I just drew it without lifting my pencil from the page. 
but I didn't draw a function, okay? So it's, that's why, that's why continuity doesn't apply, because it's not a function, okay? Are you amused or informed? <laughs> Neither. <laughs> That's the worst part, okay? Okay. Um, so let me just insert some plots. There you are, hiding from me. Insert image file. We got room here. Images. There we go. Okay, so here's a continuous function. I can draw its graph without lifting my pencil from the page. This one is discontinuous because if I try to drop straight down, it's not a function, okay? And here's the same thing that I was doing before, not a function because it includes at the point zero, we're including an entire interval, not a function. And typically here, what you need to do so that you know whether, what is the value at, I don't know, 2.4 or something where that is jumping, you typically put an open circle on one end and a solid on the other so you know exactly at that point. But we don't care because we're gonna deal with continuous things, but that's what you would do to be more precise, okay? Good enough intuitive feel for what continuity is all about? <clears throat> Nobody wants to confirm. All right, okay. So we're gonna do now the bisection algorithm and it requires continuity. We'll see why. Okay, so I don't, whoops. Save, so in case I mess up, it doesn't all go away. So this is gonna give us a practical and intuitive method to find roots of real valued functions. Functions that depend on a scalar value and produce a scalar value. So for this algorithm, there's no vectors. We will get to vectors, but this one, there's no vectors, okay? So this is, in principle, something we could have done on day one in Rob 101, but that would have been like totally against the spirit of computational linear algebra. So what I'm gonna do with bisection is give you something that's real easy to use but as we start using it, we're gonna see a cool value, a cool property of functions, and that's gonna let us solve vector problems. Okay, so this thing is based on a theorem. So it's called the intermediate value theorem. Knowledge is power, and this is a powerful theorem. Okay, so what it says is, and it's disarming in its simplicity. Suppose that F takes R to R 
is continuous and you know two real numbers A less than B. So I'll let you catch up there. <laughs> okay, so we need this continuity, so I'll underline it. Okay. We can't have jumps. <laughs> Doesn't work. If you have two real numbers, <clears throat> so we want two distinct real numbers, okay, so they can't be equal, so we'll just assume A is less than B. such that, and I'll write the key condition here in a different color, the product of the function evaluated at these points is less than zero. Okay, then we're gonna get something cool, but let's just pause here. If f of a and f of b, the product is negative, can this one be zero? No. Can this one be zero? No. Can this one be positive and this one be positive? No. Can this one be negative and this one be negative? No. One has to be positive, one has to be negative. Okay, so that's the key thing. They're on opposite sides of zero opposite sides of zero, okay? Then, whoops, then magic disappearing ink for the cool thing, then there exists a number C, an element of the reals, such that property one, C is strictly between A and B, and property two, F of C equals zero. Ooh, C is a root. Those are distinct words. Okay, strictly between A and B. Okay, that's the end of the theorem called the intermediate value theorem. There are multiple versions of this theorem. There another version of the theorem says that f takes on every value between f of a and f of b, but only value we care about is the root, okay? So that's what we're focusing on. We just, we just noticed these guys are opposite signs, so if I draw a graph, one is here, one is there, and then there's a point in the middle, someplace, where we get zero, which is awesome. Okay, so here's A, here's B, I don't know. F of A is here, F of B has to be negative. And you see it's by continuity. I can't get to here if there's no jump except if I cross zero, you know? Maybe I go back up, I come back down, who knows? And it just doesn't matter. I could start out with um, F of B being positive and F of A being negative, and who knows how it goes, okay? So this one, there are multiple C's, but I just said there exists one, and this one there would be only one C.
where we're at zero, okay? So we could have multiple roots. It's not saying that there's not another root. There exists a number. There could exist 10 numbers, okay? There could exist an infinite number of, 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 of roots. A, B, and the function goes like this. Bingo, okay, there. I have a ton of roots. All it says is there exists at least one. Okay, so why is that enough to do an algorithm? Okay, so this, this gives you an algorithm. So I'm gonna write down pseudocode, false code. Has anybody used this before to find roots of nonlinear functions? Oh, you're gonna love it, okay, when you program it up. You're gonna love it, okay? It's just super cool. <clears throat> okay, so how do you initialize your algorithm? You always gotta start out with something, right? So this is the hard part, because it depends upon your domain knowledge. You have to give a less than B such that F of A times F of B is negative. So they're on opposite sides of the Y equals zero axis, okay? So that's the hard part. Once again, this is the part you finding those that's what keeps you employed, okay? So that's the, that's the initialization. We'll start. Here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna divide that interval in half. Now, what's the chance of that being the root? Could happen. General is not going to happen, right? But that's okay. Exactly two things are possible. Okay, so you're gonna to have to check two things. What does that mean in Julia? An if statement, okay? You branch, okay? It's, it's gonna, anytime, this, this is where if statements come from. You have two things, you're checking for one or the other, or maybe there's three things, you do if this, else this, else done, okay? But there's two things are possible here. And you could get really lucky. Let's label these one. I'm not going to call them A and B, okay? F of C equals zero, okay? We are done. Let me write that in red. And I put an exclamation point because we're happy, okay? Okay, well, that's not gonna happen every time, okay? So you need to know what's, what, what do you do next, okay? So, well, the contrary to that is f of c is not equal to zero, or it's not close enough to zero. Okay. In this case, two things are possible. Okay, so I'm gonna do something that's hard for me and try to be strategic with my space here and give you guys a picture
And you know me with artistic uh, renderings, it's kind of hopeless. But <clears throat> okay, so A, B, A. And let's just suppose, okay, so then C is this thing in the middle, A plus B over 2, right at the midpoint, right? That's what it's defined to be. So <clears throat> let me draw my uh, curve. Uh, I don't have a yellow, red wouldn't be, I guess I'll stick with black. Okay, so I'm going to assume f of a is positive, then f of b is negative. So it, it could cross on this side of c. Or it could cross on that side of c, right? It's not in the middle. It, it doesn't go through c because f of c is not equal to 0. Do, do, do. So that is f of c, do, 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 do. that is f of c. So two things are possible here. It didn't go, it didn't go through c. OK. So either f of a times f of c is less than 0, or f of a times f of c is bigger than 0. You guys agree? It has, those are the only two possible cases. You can see from the picture, the logic tells you that's what it is, too, OK? So <clears throat> for the intermediate value theorem to always work, we want the product of a, f of a times f of b to be negative. So at this step, I now want to update a or b. If f of a times f of c is negative, OK, so that looks like this case. What would happen if we set, um, if we moved a over to c, we would be excluding the root if we did that, OK? If we put a over to here, we don't capture the root, OK? Whereas in this case, if we move a over to here, we, st um, we still capture the root, which is there. Okay, so if f of a is less than c, then we can keep a and we set b equal to c. Keep a, set b equals c. <laughs> Okay, because if we do that, the new f of a times f of b is negative. That's what we want for the intermediate value theorem to work. Okay, so this one, what we do is we keep b and we set a equal to c. And then the new f of a times f of b is negative. We end all the if statements. They're done. And then we loop back to start.
Okay, so this would be a wash, rinse, and repeat. Okay, that's our loop. <clears throat> we simply go through, we check either f of a times f of c is negative. This case is if and only if f of b times f of c is less than zero. So if f of a times f of c is positive, then f of b times f of c is zero. And that's why we set a equal to c, excuse me, that's supposed to be one of these guys. That's why we're doing this update. So the product of f of a times f of b stays negative. That's why we do here. If a is positive, then c is negative, so we're updating b and keeping a. If it's the opposite, we update B, we set C. So each time we're cutting the interval by two, because C is chosen in the middle. Okay, so I'm gonna show you an example and then we'll discuss convergence and what's going on there. So, yes, please. The question is, what if the graph goes down and then goes back up? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Okay, so the, the question was, suppose it's not so simple, and A, I don't know why I don't choose A to be zero. Um, so let me draw a nice curve that goes. Shoot, I didn't want to do that many of them. Okay, that's general enough. Okay, so here's C. Uh, is that close enough to A over plus B over two? Okay, but here's the key thing though, still, here's F of, here's F of C. Here's f of a, here's f of b. Now, I'm gonna move a to here or I'm gonna move b to here. I'm gonna cut my interval in half and then I'll keep iterating. So if I update um, a to here, then I'll have f of a times f of b negative and I'm good. But if I move b to here, then I would have f of a times f of b positive. And in this case, yes, there are roots, but in general, all the, all the, implicit, all the intermediate value theorem says is, I, I include all of those values. It doesn't say I can go above, it's not guaranteed, okay? So it doesn't matter. I still just look at f of c times f of a. If that's negative, then I keep A and I update B to C. And if F of A times F of C is positive, I keep B and I update A. That's my rule. Yep. And then the question was, what if um, it never looks like back then? So it's basically a parabola. And then is that, that the, this case doesn't handle it? Um, the other curve that goes back down, that doesn't happen. So after you see your graph keeps increasing. You want to come draw it for me, Tribby? I think it just means like after C, it keeps increasing. It doesn't have another move. Uh, okay, so this is positive. This one's negative. Here's C. But they don't want the F of C to be negative. You think it's going to be positive. Then F of A is positive too? Yeah. Well, then it doesn't work. Okay. 
No. So, yeah, so this is really, really, really important pseudocode. This is what's given. This has to be satisfied or you don't start, okay? So, okay, that's why I couldn't get the example because the example they wanted was, what if f of a is like this, f of b is like this, and it, you know, hey, I got lucky, I found a root, but I would not, this is, you know, do not uh, apply bisection because I fail to satisfy f of a, because here f of a times f of b is positive. So I failed to initialize the algorithm correctly. Okay, so sorry, I was slow on catching on to that. Okay, so let me insert some pictures and we'll talk about properties. You can see what's going on, image, file. No, don't want the zoom, I want this one. Okay, let me write down the polynomial. Yeah, boom. Get out of there. This is x to the fifth times 0 0.2 plus x cubed plus 3x plus 1 equals 0. <clears throat> okay, so we initialize the algorithm such that f of a times f of b is negative. Then we calculate c. So here, we almost got the root, okay? We almost got it, but we didn't. So f of c is positive. Which one do we update? Do we update a or do we update b? We always need f of a times f of b to be negative. If we were to do this, then f of this point is negative, f of this point is positive, it works. If we were to take this point to here, and so then we start looking in this half of the interval, then we would fail the intermediate value theorem, okay? So, <clears throat> so we update a to here, and that's what I've shown. Okay? Now, at this step, we calculate C in between. We divide the interval by two again, okay? And then we look at F of C, it's positive. F of A is negative, so this is a good point, and we move this one over, okay? And then F of C is positive, this is negative, we move this one over. And so you see, you just keep dividing by two, and so this interval is now eight times smaller than this one. The next one is 1 16th, 1 32nd, 1 64. You get that it, that actually converges and you can get as close as you want. We're good? Wow, I could just do this and I've got a convergence proof in Rob 101 trivia. No, but yeah, I think you guys get it, okay? So that's the, that's the key thing. And what's cool is this thing that I mentioned for polynomials of degree five and higher. Can't prove, it's been proven. The closed form solutions four roots do not exist. And once again, this is not that nobody has been smart enough to find them. They've proven that those formulas cannot be written down, okay? So that's, that's kind of an amazing uh, thing, a non-existence proof. 
Okay, so you have to use numerics in general, and this is one way to do it. So I think for scalar problems, you guys can solve almost anything. Okay. Now. Does this algorithm terminate? <clears throat> okay, see. So we initialize. We find the midpoint, and then we branch, depending on f of a times f of b negative, or f of a times f of, uh, excuse me, f of a times f of c negative, or f of a times f of c positive, okay? We branch, we keep dividing by two. Now, whoops, we only stop if we find a root. Okay, so let's just note something. I'll, I'll write it down, but how is C computed? There it is. Suppose A is a rational number, so it's an integer over an integer, right? Suppose B is a rational number. It's an integer over an integer. Guess what C is? It's also a rational number, okay? So if you start out with rational endpoints, you keep rational points A and B forever, okay? Okay, so uh, vocabulary I forgot to give you. A, whoops, I should make these highlighted, A and B. are said to bracket the root. Okay, so the thing is, if A equals rational, B equals rational, then C equals A plus B over two is also rational, which implies at every step of the bisection algorithm, the CK that we compute is, would be rational. Okay, that's kind of a hand wavy proof by induction, okay? You start out with rational numbers, you get a rational number, you update, your, your bracketing points are rational, then you wash, rinse, and repeat. Okay, so you would really prove that by induction, but we, we, we don't do it. So what if you take an example like this, okay, so we know x equals square root of two is the root, right? And so maybe we start out with A equals zero and B equals two as the bracketing points. They are rational. That implies C is always rational. And that means if we were to plug in, I'll put CK, 
that means ck squared minus 2 is never equal to 0. So we would never, ever, ever get square root of 2 out of that because square root of 2 is not rational. Okay, it's an irrational number. So that means our algorithm would never converge, okay? So it never stops. So if you just put this as your algorithm and you go return, it never comes back, okay? You just start it, it just goes, boom. And Julia just runs and runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. So what do you do, okay? Um, so what you have to do is put a termination criteria, okay? So you must add So typically you would say if absolute value of f of c is less than tolerance, break, okay? So now you have a real algorithm. You could also put an upper bound on the number of iterates if you wanted, okay? Add, um, let's see, k less than k max, okay, or excuse me, if it's greater than or equal to k max, terminate. Okay. So that gives you a real algorithm. Okay, uh, Okay. so we got that taken care of on the A list and B. Everybody think they could program this up now and just make the decisions and just, so now you can find solutions to almost any nonlinear equation to any desired degree of accuracy. Could you do that this morning? Unless you read, the, well, somebody said, yes, I read the book, and then go, like, wow, yeah, but that's almost cheating. No, it's not cheating, it's what you should have been doing. Um, now, I want to look at, the bisection algorithm with a different eye and set us up for some cool stuff on Friday. Boom, 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 boom. Let's see. Zoom. That's what I want. Okay, so now here's the same bisection algorithm. But instead of leaving the scale, oh, come on, get down there. Instead of leaving the scale fixed like I did here, collaborate, if you're my, see, this scale stayed the same, and so you could see the brackets coming in, okay? I'm going to do a zoom each, each time now, and so that I'm always showing it on the new A and the new B. Okay? You see how curvy the function is when viewed at a large scale? You see the curviness in the function when viewed at a large scale? As we start zooming in, do you see it flattening out? And here, how flat does that look? Okay, so let me ask you this. If I were to do a linear approximation of this function by getting its slope as rise over run and taking the value there, okay, so I replace the function by a linear approximation, how good would that linear approximation be when you're looking here? 
it looks pretty good, okay? Now, look at what the bisection algorithm is going to do. It's going to keep dividing this thing in half, okay, for a long while. Look what you would do if you did the linear approximation. You would say, this is the root. And look how close you would be. After four iterations, instead of doing bisection, if you were to just estimate this line by f of a minus f of b divided by b minus a, rise over run, I already know f of c because I had to calculate that to get the sign. And I put that linear function in and I calculate the root based upon solving the linear equation, I get a really, really, really good approximation to my function. Okay, Newton made this observation way back in the, what, 16th century or something, okay? It's called Newton's algorithm. So what we're gonna start on Friday is I will write down this linear approximation, show you how awesome it is, and then we'll talk about linear approximations of functions, and we're gonna get Newton's algorithm for finding the roots of nonlinear equation, and it converges much faster than the bisection. But bisection is cool. Just divide by half, it's mindless, okay? This other one, I'm gonna push you to doing some calculus, even though we don't assume calculus. I will teach you what a derivative is. Okay, guys, hope you're having fun. It's just new stuff. Keep making us more powerful every single day.